This recording is Chapter 7, Part 2 of 2, The Axial Skeletal System. There's a bone that acts as an anchor for the tongue. This is referred to as the hyoid bone. You can see the hyoid bone in this picture on the left here as well as in this picture on the right. The hyoid bone does not articulate or form a joint with any other bone in the body. It acts as an attachment point or an anchor for muscles that act on the tongue, larynx, and pharynx. The vertebral column includes seven cervical vertebrae in the neck, 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, the sacrum, and the coccyx. The sacrum is made up of five fused vertebrae, and the coccyx is formed from four fused vertebrae. An easy way to remember the number and type of each vertebra is you eat breakfast at 7, lunch at 12, and dinner at 5. The vertebral column includes curves. When a baby is born, there is a primary C-shaped curve. That's what makes babies easy to hold. That primary curve is the original curve, and it is concave anteriorly. This primary curve persists throughout our life in two areas of our vertebral column. That anterior concavity persists in the thoracic curvature as well as in the sacral curvature. So that is referred to as a primary curve. That curve is also known as a kyphotic curve. Secondary curves occur when the baby lifts up its head and starts looking around, forming a secondary cervical curve that is concave posteriorly. And that is known as a lordotic curve. The lumbar curvature occurs when the baby starts to crawl because the baby can't hold his stomach up and so the stomach falls and that causes that lumbar curvature which is another secondary lordotic curve. So the primary curves are kyphotic, the secondary curves are lordotic. The curves in our vertebral column help increase our strength, help us maintain balance when we're standing upright. They also help to absorb shock and protect the vertebrae from fracturing. An abnormal lateral curvature is known as a scoliosis. Too much curvature in the thoracic spine is called hyperkyphosis. You may see this in elderly individuals. Too much curvature in the lumbar spine is referred to as a hyperlordosis, and it can often be seen with a pendulous abdomen in someone who is obese or later in pregnancy. They may have a hyperlordotic curve. With the hyperkyphosis, Oftentimes that occurs because of compression fractures. Compression fractures usually involve the anterior portion of the vertebral bodies in the thoracic spine collapsing. So these are vertebral bodies, so if they collapse, um, that's going to cause that hyperkyphosis. Here we've got different examples of these abnormal curvatures. You can see on the far left a scoliosis. 
normally when a scoliosis occurs, there is a secondary compensatory curve. So you can see that on this side of the spine. Normally, surgery is not performed to straighten out the spine unless the curvature is greater than 25 degrees. When there is that much curvature in the spine, it causes what's known as a rib hump because one side of the rib cage will be much higher, and sometimes that can actually um, fold in on the heart and cause problems for the heart to beat correctly. And so depending on how the internal structures are affected by the structure of the vertebral column in the rib cage, it may or may not determine that surgery is required either sooner or, or later, depending on the severity of the curvature. Here is an example of hyperkyphosis. And here we have an example of hyperlordosis. When we look at the general structure of a vertebra, you'll notice that the thicker portions of the vertebrae, which are referred to as the vertebral bodies, are located anteriorly in the vertebral column. The spinous processes, which you could feel on your own back, are located posteriorly. On this picture, you can see the vertebral body anteriorly and the spinous process located posteriorly. Coming out from either side of the vertebrae are transverse processes, which are located from the lumbar spine on up to the cervical spine the cervical vertebrae have special holes in their transverse processes known as transverse foramina. The transverse foramina are only found in the cervical spine. The transverse foramina allow for the passage of the vertebral artery end vein in the first six cervical vertebrae. However, the seventh cervical vertebrae has only the vertebral vein in its transverse foramina. Another way you can tell the difference between the cervical vertebrae and the others is the spinous process tends to be bifid or forked. As we look at this vertebra, we can also see that there is a special foramen. You know that the term foramen means whole. This is the vertebral foramen. The vertebral foramen is what allows the spinal cord to traverse from our brain downward. And the vertebral foramen, as the vertebrae are stacked up on one another, the vertebral foramina form that nice passage or canal to protect the spinal cord. As the vertebrae stack up on one another, there are also holes that are formed in between the vertebrae laterally that allow spinal nerves to exit from the vertebrae. And these holes are referred to as intervertebral foramina. Because we are viewing the thoracic spine, you can also see this area where the head of a rib will form a joint or an articulation with the thoracic spine. There's actually one above and one below for one rib. So there's a superior and inferior articular facets for these ribs. Here's a closer look at the cervical vertebrae. This is the transverse process and you can see the hole that I was describing earlier, the transverse foramen. 
you can see the vertebral foramen in the cervical vertebrae is a little bit triangular in shape and is larger from the top of the spine and gets a little bit smaller as it progresses down through the rest of the vertebrae. You'll notice the bifid spinous process in the cervical vertebra that I described earlier. And this is the vertebral body. The first two bones in the cervical vertebrae have special names. The very first bone in the cervical spine is called Atlas. Atlas was the Greek mythological figure that held up the world. So think of Atlas as holding up your world, which would be your head. The second cervical vertebra is referred to as axis. The earth rotates on its axis. Now, I said earlier that 50% of nodding occurs between occiput and atlas. 50% of rotation occurs between atlas and axis. The rest of nodding and rotation is taken up by the other cervical vertebrae. After axis, normally people refer to the other cervical vertebrae as C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. We always use atlas and axis for the first two because they have specific names. Here we have a picture of atlas and axis. Atlas, you can see, is just a ring. And that is where the vertebral foramen is the largest. There is no vertebral body in atlas. You'll notice that axis, which is the second cervical vertebra, not only has a vertebral body, it also has a special tooth-like process called the odontoid process or dens. The dens is that structure around which atlas will rotate. There's a little ligament, a transverse ligament, that goes right here to hold atlas in place on top of axis so that rotation can occur. The thoracic vertebrae have the longest spinous processes, and most of the spinous processes are going to project inferiorly, downward. Many people equate their appearance to the head of a giraffe because of the long nose that the giraffe has. With the thoracic vertebrae, we have 12. There are no special names, so it's T1, T2, T3, all the way down to T12. The vertebral foramen within the thoracic vertebrae is going to be round, and there are ribs that are going to form a joint or an articulation at two places. They're going to articulate not only at the vertebral body, but also on the transverse process. So the ribs are held in place two places on the thoracic vertebrae, the vertebral body and the transverse process. The lumbar vertebrae remind people very often of a moose. There's the moose snout. There's this little jowl hanging down. There's the moose snout. And there's this jowl hanging down. There are five lumbar vertebrae. You'll notice on this picture, you can see the intervertebral foramina very nicely 
Remember, that's where nerves will exit from the spinal cord to go through the rest of the to the rest of the body. You'll also see clearly in this picture, as you've probably noticed in this model, that there are discs in between the vertebrae. These are intervertebral discs. These are made out of fibrocartilage. They are fibrocartilaginous discs. When we look more closely at the intervertebral disc, you can see that it is comprised of two portions, an outer portion called the annulus fibrosis, which makes up that fibrocartilaginous outer ring. There is an inner portion called the nucleus pulposus, which is made up of pulpy elastic connective tissue. Sometimes the nucleus pulposus will herniate. A herniation is a process where something goes in an area it's not supposed to be in. And so if the nucleus pulposus herniates through the annulus fibrosus, that could potentially put pressure on a nerve or potentially on the spinal cord. Sometimes people have herniated discs and they don't even know that they have them. They may not affect them at all. Sometimes people have very severe pain. There are also instances where a piece of the disc will break off and be on the nerve that's going to that particular area of the body that is referred to as a sequestered disc that can be extraordinarily painful. Here we have the sacrum. Remember that the sacrum was fused from five vertebrae and with the sacrum usually fusion begins around age 16 and ends completely by age 30. It's slightly different for everybody. Everybody's body is different. It helps to make a really nice strong foundation for the pelvic girdle. The female sacrum is wider, shorter, and more curved. You'll notice that sacrum has the primary curve that we call that kyphotic curve. The primary curve is a kyphotic curve. The sacrum has a wing-like area that is referred to as the sacral ala. So we have sacral alley on either side. We have foramina anteriorly and posteriorly. So we have anterior sacral foramina and posterior sacral foramina. And in the posterior portion of the sacrum, there is a sacral canal. So as the spinal cord ends, and the spinal cord actually ends at about the level of L2, it splits into another structure called the cauda equina, which means horse's tail. And some of these structures will go in different directions. Some go through the sacral canal and things will exit through the sacral canal, both anteriorly and posteriorly. And then there's also a network of nerves going to different areas as well. The coccyx is the most inferior bone in the axial skeleton. It fuses from four vertebrae, and this fusion occurs between 20 and 30 years of age. Some people refer to this as the tailbone. If you've ever fallen on yours accidentally, it can hurt for quite a while. Um, however, it's usually not a problem. These can break. If they break, they tend to break anteriorly when people fall and that can be resolved. It's not a fun resolution. When we look at different ligaments associated with the vertebral column, 
there is a special ligament called the nuchal ligament. This is attached to the cervical splinous processes as well as to the external occipital protuberance of the occiput. And the nuchal ligament helps to support the skull and prevent it from falling forward. It's really helpful in animals that have very, very heavy skulls. There is also a supraspinous ligament that helps to support the vertebral column um, during forward bending motions, and an anterior longitudinal ligament that helps prevent things from going too far backwards. So the anterior longitudinal ligament resists excess backward bending, and sometimes that ligament can stretch or tear during a car accident where whiplash is involved. The sternum consists of three portions. The superior most portion of the sternum is the manubrium. The manubrium of the sternum has a notch referred to as the jugular notch. The middle portion of the sternum is referred to as the body. And the inferior portion of the sternum is the xiphoid process. The xiphoid process is the part of the sternum that can accidentally break off if someone is doing CPR and has his hands too low on the sternum while doing chest compressions. Unfortunately, that could potentially puncture a lung, which if compressions and ventilation are being done, it kind of doesn't help the process in ventilation, but that's why it's important to know where to place one's hands when doing and performing CPR. Each of the 12 thoracic vertebrae have ribs attached to them posteriorly. Most of the ribs curve around anteriorly to form the thoracic cage. The first seven ribs for T1 through T7 each have their own cartilaginous attachment to the sternum. They attach to hyaline cartilage known as costal cartilage. You can see this costal cartilage on the left-hand side of the screen. Ribs one through seven have their own individual cartilaginous attachment to the sternum by way of this costal cartilage. Here's rib one, rib two, rib three, rib four, rib five, rib six, rib seven. You'll see rib six still has costal cartilage. Rib seven still has its own costal cartilage. However, ribs eight, nine, and 10 are going to attach to costal cartilage that fuses together as one unit that will attach to the sternum. Therefore, ribs eight, nine, and 10 are referred to as false ribs because they don't have their own costal cartilage attachment to the sternum. There's fuses together. Ribs 11 and 12 have no anterior attachment to the sternum. Therefore, they are not only false ribs, they are additionally floating ribs. They're false ribs because they don't have their own cartilaginous attachment to the sternum, and they are floating ribs because they have no anterior attachment to the sternum. Again, this is referred to as costal cartilage. Looking a little bit more closely at how the ribs attach to the thoracic vertebrae, Posteriorly, remember this is the vertebral body, which is anterior, and the head of the rib, which is the thickest part, will form an articulation or joint with the vertebral body. There is another structure on the rib called the tubercle, 
which will articulate with a facet on the transverse process of that thoracic vertebra. That is how the ribs attach posteriorly. That takes us to the end of this chapter. We're going to move on to chapter eight.